So this is the continuation of our previous fluid compartment video. More examples on the same topic. Um, so this one is a person ingests one liter of water. So ingestion of one liter of water. How will this volume uh, concentration compartment change? So the volume in the extracellular fluid is going to increase but this is also going to make this uh, extracellular compartment uh, hypotonic. So volume is going to move in here as well. So it's going to increase here as well. And this will drop the concentration. So the graph will look something like this. Okay. This would be ingestion of one liter of volume. Moving on to the next topic. So the next one is infusion of hypotonic uh, saline, half a uh, liter of infusion of hypotonic saline. So what's going to happen when we infuse hypotonic saline? It's going to increase the volume of the extracellular fluid, but it's also going to drop the concentration of extracellular fluid. Some of the volume is going to move in here just like this one. So the volume is going to increase and the concentration is going to drop. So these two are going to start to look identical. The next one is going to be, what if we infuse half a liter of isotonic, uh, isotonic saline? Now isotonic will only increase the volume because it's the same volume, right? So the volume is going to increase, but the concentration is not going to increase. So this is what's going to look like if it's isotonic volume. The next one deals with, what if instead of uh, isotonic or hypotonic, what if we infuse, um, what if we infuse Hypertonic saline. If we infuse hypertonic saline, the concentration is going to be higher in the extracellular fluid. As a result, volume is going to move in this direction, so there's going to be a volume shift. So volume is going to drop in the intracellular fluid, and um, volume is also going to be increased in the extracellular fluid, giving us this kind of picture for uh, infusion of hypertonic saline. So the last of all these examples is primary adrenal insufficiency, where fluid replacement exceeds salt replacement. For this particular case, um, when we know fluid replacement exceeds salt replacement, we know that the concentration is dropping. We know that the concentration is dropping. But since, we're, since, since it's primary adrenal insufficiency, we're losing salt from this compartment. So this compartment is becoming um, hypotonic, right? So as a result, fluid is going to rush in here. And the overall concentration of the, of the blocks is going to drop. But fluid is also going to drop from this end. And volume is going to rise on this end. So this is what we're going to end up getting. This is going to be for primary adrenal insufficiency when fluid replacement exceeds salt replacement. Now these were the examples, some of the examples of how these questions are typically asked, but there are certain other things that I want to talk about um, in this particular section. So the first one deals with DKA. Now with DKA, if the osmolarity increases more than 330, you know, because of metabolic uh, acidosis, if it increases more than 330, then we are going to start to have neurological manifestations. These are random information, but it deals with osmolarity and fluid compartments, and I don't know where to talk about this thing, so this is where I decided to talk about it. So just bear with me. So that's DKA. Next, so I, I talked about this. Next is SIADH. If the serum osmolarity drops to 120 and remains there, that is that pretty much guarantees that this is SIADH. These numbers greater than 330 neurologic manifestation, less than 120, we're pretty much sure that the disease is going to be SIADH. Next, we talk about exudate and transudate. One example of exudate would be bee sting. When the bee stings, there is going to be anaphylaxis. As a result, there is going to be pooling of uh, other you know, cytokines and interleukins and 
white blood cells and T cells. So we are going to have an exudate. Okay. What about transudate? For example, cirrhosis is going to cause transudate because uh, the liver uh, is responsible for the liver is responsible for you know making protein, making albumin. So if there is lack of protein, then we are going to have transudate. Next, I want to talk about the term dilutional hyponatremia. Let's say for some reason you have hyperosmolar extracellular fluid, and as a result, fluid move, moves from ICF to ECF. That term is called dilutional hyponatremia. Here's an interesting question. How many liters of saline do you have to infuse to get one liter of saline in your extracellular fluid? It's going to be three liters. Why? Because one third stays in the extracellular fluid. So if you infuse three liters, one liter is going to remain in the extracellular fluid. So this one is also taken care of. Next we have isotonic fluid loss. I didn't realize that I already talked about isotonic fluid loss. That's hemorrhage. It's going to cause this fluid from the ECF to, uh, to be excreted in the U you know, to be lost, not in the urine, to be lost due to hemorrhage, right? So that would be isotonic, that would be an example of isotonic fluid loss. Sweat is the loss of hypotonic, hypotonic fluid. We already talked about that. Talked about bee sting being an exudate. Next is control osmolarity. Whenever we're talking about osmolarity, the osmolarity, there is really two things that is responsible for controlling osmolarity, and that is primarily sodium, but also urea. These are the two things that control osmolarity.